people a chance to get in. Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Rudor, and I'm the editor in chief of The Forward, and I'm thrilled to have Congressman Max Rose here with us today for a live interview. Congressman Rose is in Washington, um, awaiting some votes this afternoon, not yet on the stimulus package, but um, some other business. And we're thrilled to have him. We've been watching his campaign as uh, he was elected to Congress from Staten Island, a Democrat elected from a traditionally Republican district back in 2018, really stunned everybody with that win, and then uh, lost, in a, lost his race this fall. We're gonna talk to him about that race and what he think happened and about the news he made over the weekend, filing um, papers last Thursday for an exploratory bid to run for mayor of New York City. He did interviews with Politico and with the New York Times, and now we've got him live to ask him about all of that, about why he's running for mayor, why he's thinking about running for mayor, how he plans to win. No, no politician from Staten Island has been elected mayor of New York ever since the city consolidated in 1898. So we're thrilled to have you with us. I'm gonna start in just a second, give people a chance to roll in. Wanna let you know that everybody who's here, everybody who signed up will get in your email, a video of this conversation that you can share with your friends and your social networks. We're also streaming now live on Facebook. If you wanna share that link with your friends, it's at, um, it's the Jewish Daily Forward page on Facebook. And you will also get in your email um, a discount subscription to the forward and we hope you will come back to other events and read our journalism every day and sign up for our free newsletters as well. So again, I'm Jody Rudoran, Editor-in-Chief of the Forward. I want to thank Lisa Lepson, who's our webinar host and who's helped us plan this program and especially thank Congressman Rose for joining us for this. We built it originally as an exit interview, but now with the news that you're forming this You've formed the Exploratory Committee for Mayor. We have a lot to talk about about the future. Just a couple more words about Congressman Rose. Most people, I think he's you know, well known in our community. Um, Congressman Rose served in the army, um, saw combat, one was wounded in Afghanistan, has the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. He served in his term in Congress on the Homeland Security Committee as well as the Veterans Affairs Committee. Um, he has worked previously for the in the Brooklyn DA's office and for a nonprofit health organization. He's a graduate of Wesleyan. He has a master's from LSE and on the on March 14th, he became a dad to Miles Benjamin uh, Rose, and maybe we'll have a chance to see a picture, hear a little bit more about that. But I want to, again, welcome you, Congressman Rose, and ask you the question we all want to know, which is, so you filed your exploratory papers, you uh, are thinking about running for mayor, planning on running for mayor. Um, what well, I guess you, you said it's an exploratory bid. So I want to know first what it is you're exploring. What will determine whether you, in fact, run for mayor? What are you trying to find out by sending out, you know, a, a, an announcement to your supporters, um, telling them about this? What, 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 will, what will say yay or nay? When will you decide and what will it be based on? So, Jody, it's great to, great to see you. Thanks for uh, having me on to the entire forward team. Uh, it's been such a a privilege to work with you all over the last couple of years. Um, and I sincerely look forward to many great conversations ahead. And to all those who, who came on, uh, thanks for joining. I, I, I just looked at some of the attendees and I think I see some friends. I don't wanna you know, misconstrue names, but I see the Langsoms on, Elise and Richard, who were like second parents to me growing up. Um, I see some soon to be former staffers. Asher Zlotnik is on, uh, <laughs> who I, uh, was amongst my right hands over the last couple of years and before. Um, so I guess you wanna jump right to the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, why not? Uh, look, um, coming off a campaign, uh, the one, one thing that we expressed right at the outset is, is that you can't count us out of serving going forward. Um, I'm committed to living a life of service. And certainly with this announcement of this exploratory bid, humbly and modestly, it is, it, it is reflective of that. That alone, that this city right now is at a crossroads. It's a city that has been without leadership 
for nearly eight years. You know, I saw that wa wa watching the news in the immediate aftermath of my election, seeing this fiasco with the schools, for instance, the mayor four hours late to a press conference, the schools shut down, shut down the schools reopened, the mayor and the governor not being on the same page. It seems like it is a mess. And the reason why it seems like it is a mess is because it is a mess. The city needs real leadership. And so certainly as we announce our exploration of this, there's a myriad of factors that goes into it. Um, do, do, do I have it in me with my family from a personal standpoint? We are, we are humans. Um, can you build out an infrastructure that, that quickly? Uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I don't ascribe to the notion that there are lanes in politics. I refuse to believe that. We're not gonna try to slice and dice the electorate to pre-test any kind of uh, uh, electoral advantages. That's not what this is about. But so and most importantly, as we think about this mayoral, but as we think about politics in general, it's not about me. And I know every politician says that, right? They say, it's not about me, it's about <laughs> us. They teach you that in campaign school, right? It, it, when I say that this is not about me, what I'm talking about is the fact that our city is at an incredible crossroads. We all know that we have to save New York City from a woeful fiscal crisis. We all know that we are in the midst and the throes of an unprecedented public health crisis, an unprecedented pandemic that we have been the epicenter of for much of the last year. But there's another elephant in the room. And that is what type of New York do we want going forward? Do we want to just go back to the New York of old? I don't think that that's what we want. And I say that as a fourth generation New Yorker. So for, for, for decades, and I would not have become the youngest male congressman in, in America and the youngest Jewish congressman in America were it not for everything that New York City gave my family. So I take what you said about the, the lanes and everything that you said. Um, and in your, in your message to supporters, um, announcing the exploratory bid, you described the campaign of, as an underdog campaign and that you'd be an underdog in every way. So I wanna ask you, press forward about that a little bit. Um, you're a moderate from the most conservative part of the city running in a process that favors liberals with a liberal primary electorate. There's already another moderate in the race. You have no city hall or city administrative experience. You'd be running against a, at least one borough president and, a, and, and the um, comptroller, Scott Stringer. It's, 2020 has been this year of racial reckoning in our city and across the country. And you're a white guy at a time a lot of people are looking for a leader of color for the city, a mayor of color. And you're from Staten Island, where, as I said earlier, nobody has ever uh, gone to the consolidated uh, mayoralty. So what do you see as the path? What do you see as the potential coalition for you? And who do you see as your biggest opponents, the people you would, and, and I, I guess to, to play also, also off your, your thing about what you said about wanting to serve, it's like, you know, another option would have been to endorse one of these other candidates and work with them. You didn't have to run yourself. So sure. talk about that a little bit. What a question. A lot of questions. Talk about jumping on the bandwagon. Well, first of all, New York City has a long held tradition of electing short mayors during times of crisis. Let's not forget LaGuardia and Bloomberg. So history is on my side here. How tall are you? Should we decide to do this? Uh, publicly, I'll say we'll probably say I'm five, seven, five, eight. Privately, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, the, the, there is a deeply flawed and I say this respectfully, but a deeply flawed perception of politics that underlies your question, which is that somehow there are labels that we can ascribe to people that act, actually reflect reality. Now, nothing pisses me off more than when a politician says, so as to dodge exactly the question that you just asked, they say, well, you have to understand, and there are certain candidates in this race right now saying this, well, you have to understand that I'm a pragmatic progressive. I'm a progressive who gets things done. I have Bloomberg's managerial acumen with de Blasio's values and you come away from that conversation not knowing what the hell someone just said. 
So let me tell you who I am before we start talking about any electoral math. I'm on the side of the working class, plain and simple. I've described myself as a populist in the past, um, and I embrace the notion of moral populism. I embrace the notion of inclusive populism. And my North Star when it comes to policymaking is the fact that there is a system in place, both in New York City, as well as the rest of the country, that has completely ripped people off. And when it's not ripping people off, it's ignoring them or vice versa. So that is the system. That is the edifice that we have to actually wage war on so that we can put our government back on the side of those who have been following the rules, have kept their head down, have been striving to serve their families and their communities for so long, and they haven't received the gains that they see others benefiting from all around them. Just look what's happened during this pandemic, millionaires, billionaires, making out like bandits while many were at a near 20% unemployment. And previous to that, real wages were stagnating for so long. You see these politics, uh, playing out before us in New York City. Developments rising in many neighborhoods uh, while people are being displaced. Uh, wages again stagnating, Commu commuting time just getting longer. Um, segregated communities like never before. Different educational systems really being found in different pockets of New York City. This is what we have got to address. And you're not going to do that successfully if you come out saying, I'm the moderate, if you come out saying, I'm the, the, the progressive. You have to rise above that and talk about addressing the true underlying stresses, anxieties, and pressures on working people. And that should take bold policies, and that should take New York City leading the way. Some things that I think New York City is perfectly aligned to do right now, whether it's me, if I undertake this thing, or somebody else, and to your point. I, we can put these issues on the map. There should be a New York City universal basic income for the working class and for those who are in poverty. There should be guaranteed K through 14 for all in New York City. There should be massive property tax reform in New York City. So Bill de Blasio's home in Park Slope, he does not pay a lower property tax than someone with a half a million dollar home or a quarter million dollar home in the outer boroughs is paying. Uh, public employees, city workers should get discounts, should get, uh, sh should have things that reflect that they are the pride and joy of New York City. One thing is, is I think that they should get a property tax discount. All city workers, I come from a long line of New York City teachers. We got to start treating our city workers better, not just calling them essential. These are the types of ideas, you can call them what you like. But I think that they are strictly on the side of those who have not been paid attention to for all too long by our elected officials. So you mentioned, you know, that obviously it's a very crowded field and you talked about you, one of the things you're trying to do is put issues on the table. There may be other people who can, um, who would have similar opinions and who you could support. One of the things that uh, is ahead of us is this decision on ranked choice voting. And I wonder if you can help us understand what feels very, very complicated. What is ranked choice voting in New York City? Uh, what's likely to happen? And how central is that to your path, to your potential electoral well, strategy? Has nothing, no one should decide whether or not to run for office based on whether or not ranked choice voting exists. That's idiotic. Um, and I think that's stupid. You know, you, you, you should, there's a myriad of other things that go into whether or not you run for office having run for office now twice, it shouldn't be on whether a previous electoral system stays in place or a new one. Um, ranked choice voting it, it has been long been a cause of good government groups or supposed good government groups um, like Common Cause. And they, uh, it, it's basically a means by which you can vote for more people than just one. Uh, and some people argue it favors moderate. Some people argue it reduces negative campaigning. Whatever it may be, it remains to be seen whether ranked choice voting will stay in place going forward. Um, I have my own. Do you believe in it? Do you like ranked choice voting? Look, I respect the will of the people when they make a decision like this. I don't think that uh, ranked choice voting should be something that is nationwide mandated at the federal level. Um, it, uh, New York City wasn't the first place to do it. I have serious, serious doubts as to whether the Board of Elections can pull this off. 
um, from both an educational standpoint, as well as from just building out the systems. And they owe it to us to prove that they can before sending in over a million New Yorkers to cast their votes in an election. So I, that's where I stand right now. Like I'm not going to say, let's go forward with this until the BOE proves that that's possible. Um, but you, you look, it has to be a significant factor when 75% of New Yorkers come out for something in a referendum. You can't just turn around and automatically say no to that. Sure. Um, so it, that, that remains to be seen, but it, it, you, you can't, I believe that in the, uh, elections, like the, the voice of the people will be heard, uh, plain and simple. So you've been very critical of Mayor de Blasio, including here in the first few minutes of this forum and, and in framing your, your possible bid. Tell us three specific things you would have done differently than he did with the coronavirus and in terms of handling that pandemic. Three things where you thought he just went the wrong way, did the wrong thing. Well, look, I just mentioned one when it came to schools. Um, I, I have been uh, pretty loud about the, the state of the indoor dining situation. Um, I think if done correctly, if done a low, at a low percentage, we could have started indoor dining uh, sooner. That's why I was advocating for it sooner, considering as well, um, you know, legislative sociopaths like Mitch McConnell standing in the way of things like the Restaurant Act. Uh, and significant and viable aid for our restaurant owners. Although we are looking like we're gonna get something significant across the finish line, fingers crossed, we shouldn't leave Washington DC. Um, we shouldn't stop working here in Washington DC until we can get that done. Uh, so education, uh, we, we, we could have opened up our schools sooner if we emphasized uh, outdoor education as well. Um, some private schools did that. They, 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 we shouldn't see private schools doing something that our public education system can't accomplish. That, that does a, a massive discredit to our students um, and our families. Uh, secondly, the whole dining situation. Third, uh, we, we have failed when it comes to testing. Um, you know, if you look at the ways in which general COVID policy, but testing in particular was transitioned from the public health agency over to health and hospitals. Um, it, it didn't make sense, organizationally speaking. Uh, and it, we, we have stayed in this reactive testing model, when in reality, we should be forcing or pushing much more of a proactive testing model so we can identify clusters rather quickly um, and act accordingly. Lastly, when it comes to COVID, and on Staten Island, we actually did this in a remarkable way. This is mainly, or at least in part, a battle of uh, hospital capacity. Uh, on Staten Island, we, we were able to uh, convert a psychiatric center into an overflow for one of our, for our largest hospital system, as well as uh, another hospital system on Staten Island. So immediately we're providing over 200, or at least the capacity for over 200 more beds. The last thing you want during COVID is for our hospital systems to get overrun. I think that is something that our, the city could have come together on to do in a much more robust and substantive manner, proactively showing people that we are prepared for that second and third surges that we know were at least a high likelihood. It just felt like everything was so flat-footed. Yeah. And, and then lastly, a few times, but let me just add one more thing. We're the most, we're the richest city in the world. Um, most prosperous city in the world. There was also an incredible opportunity for the mayor to gather private resources together, to provide his own relief fund for restaurants, to provide his own relief fund for those who were hardest hit by this pandemic, particularly in underserved communities of color, as well as to make New York City a center of innovation for how to deal with COVID. We've done that in crises of past. The real estate community was able to step forward and said, we're gonna front some of our tax payments. None of that happened this time. Now that's the fault of this mayor, definitely, but that's also the fault of the private sector. That's also the fault of our business leaders who did not step up nearly enough in concert with our city government. Everybody should have stepped forward and that didn't happen. So uh, one thing you didn't mention was the way that de Blasio and also the governor um, interacted with the Orthodox communities in Brooklyn, which was something we've, of course, covered extensively. And it's just one example of how 
many New York City mayors, I think, have struggled to find the right balance with the ultra-Orthodox communities in our city. They're clearly a valuable political block. Um, but the, whether it's about anti-vaxxers or in this case, uh, resistance to coronavirus social distancing restrictions or what kind of secular education there should be in yeshivas, sometimes there's real tension. Have you given any thought as to sort of how you would thread that needle? Well, it's, it's not about threading the needle. And that's exactly the problem here. Um, they, they dealt with it in the wrong way. Um, using the wrong language, the mayor used the wrong language. Um, you know, when you talk about this being a problem in Jewish communities, um, look, I, I, I've been to, and, and I've been deeply involved in many of the communities that he was referring to. There's no homogenous neighborhood in New York City, particularly the ones he was referring to. It's a, uh, as Mayor Dinkins said, still representative of the beautiful, beautiful cultural mosaic that is New York City. You shouldn't call people out by their religious affiliation ever, ever, especially in situations like this, because it brings about further hate and verbal attacks. Um, it could even get worse than that, as we saw previous to the pandemic. Secondly, these are the types of things that should not be dealt with first in public statements. It's just not the way that you should, you have to gather community leaders together virtually or safely in person and talk about how to address this. If there's a problem, figure it out first privately. That was never, that attempt was never made, at least in a significant manner. It was made after the fact, after everyone was offended. Uh, that, that, that was totally and utterly wrong. And then lastly, I think it is so vital that we continue to acknowledge the deep pain that our communities, so many communities, but the Orthodox Jewish community and the Jewish community in general are going through. Communities particularly that are filled with small businesses where no, no small business owner, and I say this, you know, my great grandfather uh, started a diner in Williamsburg in 1928. Uh, I wouldn't be here were it not for the ability of small business owners to succeed in New York City. He sold that diner way too early, but that's that's an <laughs> it's condos now. But, but but you know, small business owners haven't felt like anyone's on their side in New York City. They keep on getting fines loaded up on them. Uh, you know, they, nothing that no one ever seems to have their back. Um, and there was never really truly, and this is why the, the mayor should have started a relief fund um, for these business owners. There, there was never really that sensitivity towards what they're going through. As you just, as you, oh, we're turning this to an orange zone, as if it's just a, co a color change. That's people's lives on the line. That's their life's work on the line. And you just mentioned it in a PowerPoint switch. It, it, it's not right. You mentioned Mayor Dinkins, and I know you endorsed Bloomberg for president, but you, you told the New York Times that Mayor Dinkins was the best mayor of your lifetime. Um, I wonder if you could tell us briefly why, yeah. why Mayor Dinkins, and what about Cron Heights? Well, so first of all, I, I'd be honored to receive, uh, you know, should I do this, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, endorsement. And, and that, that wasn't um, in by any ways an indictment of him. Um, there had been no perfect mayor uh, in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime of New York City. Um, Certainly, when it came to what happened in Crown Heights, there at that point was a failure to bring the city together um, and a failure on the part of everyone uh, for us to figure out a way to avoid violence. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen that again in New York City more recently. Now, with that being said, though, I do think historically speaking, this is particularly apt right now as Mayor Dinkins recently passed, that we do acknowledge his successes. We acknowledge the initiation of community-based policing. We acknowledge the effort to completely transform City Hall. We acknowledge the effort to finally uh, start to address New York City's fiscal situation. And we acknowledge the effort albeit not, never performed perfectly, to embrace 
the beautiful cultural mosaic that is New York City, to give it a voice and to say that irrespective of where you come from and what you look like, we will strive for a New York City where you're given a fair shake, where you have equal opportunity and where you most importantly have all the resources necessary to fulfill your dreams and the dreams for your family. So move it, we'll set the mayoral stuff aside for just a sec. I wanna talk about what you, you know, learned in Washington in particular uh, in this really tough, hard fought race in 2020, you were in the army. So what's your after action report for your own 2020 campaign? Why did why did you lose? What happened? Well, you know, it's interesting. After you win a race, um, everyone thinks you ran a perfect race. No one ever does after action reports, as they say in the military, AARs, after you win, they just congratulate <laughs> you. And by the way, you get a lot more text messages after you win a race than if you lose a race. I tell you, man, it's unbelievable. You know, this thing was silent. It was unbelievable. Um, but after, conversely, after you lose, everybody has an opinion. And it, nothing seems to have gone right. And it feels, it feels like all your friends and family are debating your cause of death as you lie there in your open casket. <laughs> No, no, no win is as good as it looks. No loss is as bad as it looks. But let, let's let's look at what happened in my race, though. One, Donald Trump in 2016 won uh, uh, my district by more than he won the state of Texas. It's one reason why people were so uh, shocked by my win. Uh, in 2020, he won by even more. I ran in 2018 and I still live my life according to this notion that I'm not going to wield a, part, a blind partisan pitchfork. I'm not gonna be just partisan for partisan sake. Um, with that being said though, I swore an oath to the constitution, not to politics. And when I was faced uh, with the issue of what occurred with the president's dealings with Ukraine, I did make the decision ultimately to support the impeachment inquiry and ultimately to support the impeachment of the president of the United States. And with doing so, I may have very well uh, ended my uh, short term political future, but I would do it again because I, politics be damned, I was in office to do the right thing. Um, so that could have been a factor. Um, certainly then policing in America became a very significant factor. And my participation in a Black Lives, a very peaceful Black Lives Matters march to a local police precinct on Staten Island, where, in which I was the only elected official to take part in this march, also played a factor. Um, and again, not a march to defund the police, but a march under the banner of peace, uh, wherein young leaders in my community, uh, many of whom are young people of color sought to be heard by the police so that they could fight for an America that encapsulate, encapsulates justice for all. And within three hours of my participation in this march, and I went there with uh, my wife and our newborn son, um, the head of the uh, Sergeant's Benevolence Association criticized me in the New York Post saying I just indicted every police officer in New York City um, for, the action, for actions of another officer thousands of miles away. And then within several weeks to a month, millions of dollars of negative advertisements were coming at me saying that Max Rose marched with them, the rioters, the looters, the defund crowd. And to a certain extent, look, that's politics, all right? Like I signed up for this business. You want to lie about me? I get it. But what was so disgusting about this is what they did to the community. What was so disgusting about this is that when you have these young leaders who are incredibly inspirational, who are still fighting for a better community, for a better America, they had no fear of, no regard for positioning them as angry people of color who we should be afraid of rather than who we should listen to. And so what, what I will not allow for is for anyone to look at my race and my electoral loss and blame it on somebody else to say, well, Max Rose lost, so we need to retreat from criminal justice reform. We need to retreat from trying to pursue justice for all. We need to retreat from trying to address socioeconomic inequities and housing inequities. It was my name on the ballot. I take responsibility for my loss. And under no circumstances should we ever retreat from fighting for those issues. Because if you're not willing to go to Washington DC or any other legislative chamber and risk it all 
Politics be damned, you do not deserve to be there in the first place. And whether or not I ever serve another day in elected office, that's always the type of human I'm going to be. But certainly if I ever did serve in office again, that's the type of elected official I'll always want to be. So I have a couple of questions right on this point from some of our people in our audience that I want to share with you. The first is from Nicholas Chin, who I think is a constituent of yours. He says, I'm a young Democrat living on the North Shore, Mariners Harbor section of Staten Island, and was proud to cast my first vote for you this cycle. I was disappointed how your opponent utilized your involvement in the BLM march and as a weapon to vilify you and young Black people like myself. What advice would you give your successor about how she should go about making all Staten Islanders feel welcome and represented? You, you started that question, but I'll give you another shot at it because I wanted to uh, hear from Nicholas. And also, Carol Shapiro says, how do you really feel about the police and what accountability measures can we implement to weed out the bad apples? So we'll start with, you know, what, what, what do you think, how do you send, what, what's the right way for elected officials to uh, speak to the communities that you were trying to help represent? And what do you think about the police? If you can get briefly on both. Well, look, I think that generally on the part of elected officials, it's important to, uh, the Lord gave me two ears and one mouth. And I think it's important that we use those in equal proportion. Um, and so certainly I would uh, suggest to my successor that she listen to those who she has hurt um, with her campaign, um, but that's going to be her prerogative. Um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I want the best for community and uh, I don't intend on being blindly and in a hyper-partisan manner, uh, but I do suggest she does the right thing because um, it was disgusting. Now, um, when, it, when it comes to the generally the police, let me first of all say this. It's for so many of our officers every day they're leaving their family and they're hugging their loved one goodbye. They're hugging their kids goodbye and they don't know if they're coming home. And their family doesn't know if they're coming home. And they're also living with the stress of this feeling that they have, which honestly, I, 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 got a, I felt a, a, a tinge of this in Afghanistan too, where man, I could do the right thing for my entire career. And when something goes bad, the entire world's gonna come crashing down on me. And my guilt will be presumed rather than my innocence. And, Politicians will take advantage of the situation and the media will take advantage of the situation. And that sentiment does cause an inordinate amount of stress and anxiety. And I do think that that is something that we have to have sensitivity towards and sympathy for. Um, and it's for that reason that I believe our police officers and for that reason and so many others that I think our police officers, as well as all of our public servants need to be paid more. Um, now, with that being said, though, our police officers also have extraordinary responsibility and extraordinary power. And you cannot give an institution that much power. You cannot give in individuals that much power without having significant and nonetheless fair accountability measures in place. Um, now, we spend so much time in it, trying to build those accountability measures outside of policing institutions, right? And there is a role for government to play. Uh, for that reason that I was a proud supporter of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Um, so there's roles for the uh, government to play all the way up to the federal level, but I also think that it is the role of city leaders to build a police department that also can build in accountability mechanisms into itself. Um, we all forget that the mayor appoints the police commissioner. We all forget that the mayor appoints the civilian leadership of the police department, and that is an accountability mechanism in and of itself that is often not acknowledged. You know, we see these deep fissures between the police commissioner and the mayor in New York City, and it doesn't make any sense. The police commissioner works for the mayor. It's not a separate entity, is it? And so if, if the police commissioner wants to step out of line and wants to try to sing, you know, dance to his own tune, and doesn't follow the mayor's orders, doesn't follow the mayor's policy nor star, and that goes for any civilian appointee of a police department, you, sh you shouldn't be there. And that in and of itself is an important accountability mechanism that I think we have to emphasize. But we can't 
forget as well about trust building. The community does not trust our policing system. It doesn't trust our criminal justice system. Uh, and we have got to start to address that. And part of addressing that is also acknowledging a legacy of injustice. You know, I got my start um, in politics where, uh, being a special assistant to Brooklyn's first African-American district attorney, Ken Thompson. And Ken built programs like Begin Again to eliminate thousands of warrants tied to low level summonses um, that were particularly concentrated in communities of color where police officers were concentrated. Summonses tied to riding your bicycle on the sidewalk you know, walking your dog without a leash, uh, loitering, being in the park after dark. I grew up in Park Slope in the 80s and the 90s. No one got tickets in Park Slope for that. And, and that type, the, the, the scar tissue from that type of policing, the scar tissue from stop and frisk, the scar tissue from quota-based policing, the present reality of implicit quota-based policing is something that we have got to address head on. Head on, if we want any sense of rebuilding trust, building trust between our government, policing most especially, and the community. So I just to follow up on this, Bain, you know, you've, you've really spoken eloquently um, about Black Lives Matter, about police killings. Um, you were at that march, and now you're talking about accountability. You're from Staten Island. So should the officers who killed Eric Garner still be on the force? Well, and what would you do? Uh, Officer Pantaleo was fired. Um, and I think that that is a judgment. I've said this before that it, it should not have taken Bill de Blasio five years to come to that conclusion. Um, you can't keep wounds like this open for five years. Um, now that, that, that judgment is separate from the judgments of a justice system, right? You can't, you couldn't force the justice department to go faster. You couldn't, you know, albeit. Uh, our district attorneys at times uh, are woefully inadequate. But, but you would have fired him earlier. Well, I think that, yes, like he, he, he the, the decision that was arrived at, it shouldn't have taken five years. But one of the things that is often forgotten in issues like Garner, but so many others, is the role and function of supervisors. Um, in, in the military, that, that was that, you know, it, that, that's not often the case. And I, I, I was brought up and came of age in the military, right? So you can't like, for some reason, when it comes to police accountability, we're always looking at the officer right in the situation and we never, we forget about the police officer. We forget about the supervisors. Um, and, so would you have had more discipline for was, other, other officers involved? Well, I'm not going to speak to individual cases, right? But I think that that is generally a culture that is a big, big problem where like you can just throw the lowest ranking person under the bus and the, the white shirts or, or whoever else are never held accountable. And it's ridiculous. It's totally and utterly ridiculous. Um, and it's one reason why I suspect people feel like, you know, lower level uh, officers feel like, they're always thrown under and, and, and they're right to feel that way in part uh, because like supervisors just completely go away scot-free. Um, and this is why I talk so much about a culture change when it comes to policing. Um, and it, because that, that type of culture change is, is so vital. So um, I'll give you a soft one. <laughs> you started out by saying you're on the side of the working class. You mentioned that you were the youngest Jewish congressman uh, in America, maybe ever. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't know. We, we never looked at that. Someone in the chat can help us with the trivia. But I guess I want to ask you a little bit about who is Max Rose, the Jew. What, what, tell us about your Jewish identity and your, your Jewishness. You mentioned your great-grandfather's diner and I don't know what else you want to tell us about your family but I'm interested in who you are uh, Jewishly. You know it, it's interesting that um, I was raised in Brooklyn. Uh, my father was raised in Marine Park. Uh, his father as well. My mother raised in the Lower East Side and then in the other parts of Brooklyn like Prospect Lefferts Garden and then I went to college in uh, uh, Connecticut grad school in London and growing up with that type of background and pedigree you, you kind of think everyone is Jewish or, or if everyone's not Jewish, like everyone's got a Jewish friend. Um, bar mitzvahs are like part of your social calendar. I, and then I went to, I listed in the military and you, you see that 
uh, that's a very far from the truth. Um, and you, you, I was kind of thrust with this. For the first time, I was the first Jew that people met. And what was interesting, the going through that process of hearing for the first time, well, oh, you guys don't have horns? And hearing the term, oh, you got Jude. I, I actually, being Jewish became more of my identity um, in a way that I hadn't, I hadn't kind of thought about growing up. I mean, I, I got bar mitzvahed and I went to Union Temple in Park Slope, um, right on Eastern Parkway and um, had a wonderful and dynamic female rabbi named Linda Goodman. And, you know, definitely was you know, of the Jewish brand, you know, the, the liberal reform Jew where, you know, you might eat a cheeseburger before uh, shul, like- Or in, at. Or, or, you know, but um, being Jewish was also cultural. Right. Um, it was it was whether your your parents have NPR on the you know, uh, on the radio it was whether the Times is a part of your life. It was whether, uh, you know, it's going to Zabar's was a, you know, a, a, a religious uh, right or practice in and of itself. You know, it, and, and I, I think that it's one of the most beautiful aspects of being a New York Jew is that it's not just about religion. It just isn't. It's about culture and it's about community and it's about values. Um, and when I think about that, as well as um, understanding the religion, uh, I, I wouldn't be who I am were it not for that. Um, and I hope to impart some of that upon my son too. You, and as you were talking just now, you mentioned uh, your army experience and I think a, a, a kind of harsh comment that somebody maybe made or that you overheard. Have, have you suffered from anti-Semitism? What's the worst anti-Semitic thing that's ever happened to you? You know, I, I have definitely heard anti-Semitic comments. Um, and there's an element of death you know, not death by a thousand cuts, but you know, the, the, the stresses of it build up over time. I've, as a member of Congress, received death threats and um, aggressive language associated with my background, particularly because of all the efforts that we did uh, against the global neo-Nazi movement and the global white supremacist movement and the domestic movement as well. Um, some of it, some of these efforts did have to get the uh, law enforcement involved. Um, I, I do think it's important to note that maybe not less so because I'm a public figure and people know my religious background, but being Jewish is not is, is something that over the course of the vast majority of my life, I didn't have to wear on my, um, you know, as a part of my persona. Um, and, and there's a fundamental distinction there from the prejudice that other people face. Um, but, and then of course, politically, people did have a tendency to bring up Bloomberg, Soros, and other Jewish donors as it related to my candidacy. Um, and then, you know, I, I, there, there was this constant notion of um, Max Rose, he's not one of us. That was often a, a campaign effort made against me. Now you could say, oh, Max, it's because you were born and raised in Park Slope, but, um, it always felt like there was a, some other tinge to that. Uh, but who, who knows? I'm not going to ascribe that to someone. Um, but I've been lucky in life that uh, others have faced far worse than I have. Yeah. Um, I want, we kind of glanced over Trump a little bit. And you, you talked about, you know, your vote on impeachment. And... Obviously, as a Democrat elected from a district that Trump won and that had been historically Republican, you were in that hot seat along with a handful of colleagues on any number of votes um, about whether you were going to stick to partisan lines, whether you're going to speak out against Trump or how harshly. And I just wonder if looking back, if you have any regrets about any of the times that you either did or didn't side um, where, where you fell out on, on anything to do with President Trump. Yeah, you know, I don't regret the times that I stood up to the president. Um, I don't regret, um, you know, there were certain moments when I thought that he did the right thing and I said it, you know, well, one was the example of the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Um, 
if anything, and I'm not, I'm not one often who feels deep regret, but I, I, I think that there's an element, uh, sometimes the language that I've used, um, and this is you know, just a, a learning process in life. You know, no one's perfect. And I think sometimes we think that elected officials are perfect um, or that they emerge as a fully formed entity and that they're incapable of evolving. Um, I think sometimes the language I use generally in politics was too harsh. Um, and that is not, that's something to, to work on. That's something to work on. Okay. Is there, are there any New Year's resolutions or anything you're thinking about like that? If anybody catches me cursing publicly in 2021, I will donate $500 to a charity if they're choosing. That's How about the forward? You could just commit it to be the forward. We're a nonprofit. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I will do my very best to get you to curse in public. That's one of my favorite games. If anybody catches me cursing publicly, you can get it on video or audio in 2021. 500 nice. Okay. And I want to go back to, um, do we, I, I don't know how we're doing on time. We weren't sure if you were going to stay till three or quarter of, do you know? Three is fine. Three is fine. All right. We can keep going. So um, audience, if you have more questions, please do put them into the Q&A, as I said earlier. Um, Susan Levy wants to know, what do what did your Republican colleagues say about President Trump in private? I don't know if you're going to be able to. You have you have like 15 more days yeah. to curse in public. So. Uh, <laughs> so. First of all. Yes, some of them in private say that guy's a real idiot. Um, some of them in private say, which some of them say publicly too, I wish he didn't say X, Y, or Z. Um, but there's, all, there's often this underlying notion of, well, I like what he does. Well, as much as Trump's language is horrific, xenophobic, disgusting, in and of itself is disqualifying for her ever to hold that office again, or ever to have held that office in the first place, I do think it's important that we maintain a, fo a focus and never forget about what he did as well. That he did things like a racist Muslim man that sent a message to millions of Muslim Americans that they are not equal Americans and they do not have a home and a future here in the United States of America. Uh, things like a disgusting border policy centered around separating scared children from their even more scared mothers. Um, it, we, we can't ever lose sight of the thousands of different things that he did that we will now have to spend years repairing this country and fixing our government as a consequence of. Um, I would also say that often members of Congress are not talking about politics. I mean, it, it, uh, and that's a good thing too. I mean, I think relationship building is essential. Um, since I, I'm not going up to Jim Jordan in the gym and saying, well, let me put you on the spot about Donald Trump. Um, because if there's anything I learned in Congress, and this is such a tightrope to, to walk, and it's not easy. They say all politics is local. Con all of Congress is personal. All of it. Amidst all of the caucuses, amidst all of the policy differences, you're still dealing with 435 human beings that take great offense when you say something about them, social media, publicly or otherwise, more offense than I ever thought that they would take. Um, you know, I say something about Kevin McCarthy publicly, and suddenly, you know, I got a couple of, you know, who knew, who knew? But I do have deep respect for the fierce sense of urgency and a deep commitment to the fierce sense of urgency that we have to show towards those who cannot afford lobbyists and corporate PACs and TV time who desperately need government action right now. And we cannot allow for the vision of the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Uh, that comes with stimulus packages, that comes with infrastructure packages, that comes with everything. It doesn't mean that we compromise everything we believe in. It doesn't mean that we compromise the vast majority of what we believe in, but it does mean, mean that we have got to, in a divided government, try to find common ground and engage in bipartisan action. Um, I think that's important. You, um, you talked about what, focusing on what Trump, President Trump did and then listed a bunch of things you thought he did that were terrible. How did you feel about the, his various policies 
regarding Israel, moving the embassy, recognizing the Golan, negotiating the Abraham Accord, defunding the Palestinian missions. We we can go down the line here. I mean, um, I thought it was correct to move the embassy. Um, Golan Heights, I I didn't have a problem with either. Um, I I think the Abraham Accords, look, I welcome peace. Um, And when it, you know, looking at Bahrain, UAE, and now it's expanded to Morocco and others. Um, now, here's what's interesting, though, about this. And again, I've I voted to impeach the guy. Okay, like I I I thought that he became an enemy of much much of what we hold dear in this country. But often, what we have to consider as well is the credibility with which the American people perceive us to have. And if you actually want to improve the world, if you want to actually try to make an impact on our body politics, if you actually want to try to morally and ethically persuade people to reform their views, then your credibility really matters. And I think it is important for people to also not blindly oppose any administration. You know, when you stand up and you when you say, look, the Abraham Accords is a good thing. I'm proud that we are moving towards peace. And I, I suggest that we unite as Americans to continue to fight for that. I, I don't think that, that, that it's a false choice to say that you can do that. And then at the same hand, fight the racist Muslim ban with everything you have and support impeachment when you think it is the right thing to do and to seek to fight for, for an ethical border and immigration policy. Like these things are, in a sense, there's, they're intertwined. Um, and we, we have lost that a little bit uh, in, in the way we conduct our politics. Thank you. Um, so getting back to the city and the potential mayoralty, I have a question from Zana Klein, who says, how do you plan to stand up to the powerful teacher unions that put in this questioner's mind, put their interests before children? How will you address the high level of learning that was lost during the pandemic. So you've talked a little bit about um, your frustration with the de Blasio's handling of the um, pandemic and schools, but but what about the teachers union? This is a major force in city politics, a, a major challenge for any mayor. So a, a few things here. One, when it comes to the pandemic, I thought that we should have acted early to, in, during the summertime, there shouldn't have been a summer vacation, uh, engage in outdoor learning, Um, with the plan that summer vacation happens from Thanksgiving or December 15th to March 1st. Think about if we had done that. Just think about it, right? Think about how how much of a better situation we would be in right now. And I think that there's no reason to believe we couldn't have gotten all everyone engaged in uh, in that program. I, my, I come from a long line of teachers. My, my great grandmother was one of the early female public school principals in New York City. My grandmother, a proud UFT member, uh, taught in Harlem. My mother, a PSC CUNY community college professor at BMCC, and my aunt, a proud UFT member as well. Now, that doesn't, that's not a policy, but I, I, I do, I will not engage in any effort to vilify our teachers or the union that fights for them. Uh, and fights on their behalf. I think one of the biggest misconceptions that we have about New York City is that we do not, our educational system can be improved. Are our teachers perfect? No, or are, is our union perfect? No, is there massive bureaucracy failures? Absolutely. But when you go to specific zip codes in New York City, families are fighting to get into public school. Fighting. Some of them lie about their addresses to get into New York City public schools. You compare New York City public schools and certain zip codes staffed by proud UFT members. You compare them to schools around the country, around the country, and they overperform. The truth of the matter is, is that what New York City has is there's a poverty problem, it is a housing problem, and it is a segregation problem. If you want to address our educational system, then you have got to look at those things rather than engage in an unnecessary conflict with the organization that just seeks to have our teachers' backs. Now, whether I'm a mayor or whether I'm a dog catcher or whether I'm just a proud New Yorker, as I have always been, I don't, the only person that I blindly follow is Lee Rose, my wife. <laughs> That's the only person that I blindly say yes to. 
No one else. Okay, and, and we, of course we, we need a mayor who is always wants to put New York first and doesn't just uh, say yes to vested interests. But we have been, we have just played this game for far too long of chucking our teachers under the bus when it comes to ways in which we can improve the state of New York City. And I'm not gonna be that guy. So Michael, last question from the audience, I think Michael um, Lewin has a question. He says, you know, you've spoken a lot about what you would spend more money on in the city. Um, but reality is that there's likely to be a big budget deficit. So what, um, and, and he points out that you need state permission to raise some taxes. So he says, the better question is how would you cut spending? What would you cut in order to make room to add to the places you've talked about adding? There is certainly some real fat in the New York City government. I mean, anyone who looks at it and disagrees, I think, is is crazy. Particularly in the you know the the extraordinary bureaucracy that Bill De Blasio has built. Um, under no circumstances, though, you know, should we mistake fat for bone um, and start going after sanitation services, start going after educational services, start going after universal pre K, start going after social services, start going after capital accounts. You can't cut your way out of this crisis. You have to grow your way out of it, and you have to invest your way out of it. Now, how do you do that, I think, is, is the deeper question here. And there's a few things that we should, we should point to. One is that we do have to continue to attract businesses to New York City, because if you don't have tax revenue, you can't build the government we all know is possible and build the most viable and significant security net in, in the world so that people aren't sleeping on the streets, so that people have a great education system, so that no one's working 40 hours a week and can't afford shelter and food and providing for their children. So you have to attract business, uh, there's no doubt. But the social contract has been broken in New York City, particularly around development and housing. So what do we do? And I think this is where our universal basic income efforts could come into play. If you <coughs> made a very simple agreement and that is when we upzone communities. And one of the biggest disgraces of the Blasio mayorality is that he only upzoned poor communities. You didn't upzone Upper West Side. You didn't upzone downtown Brooklyn. You didn't upzone Tribeca. You didn't upzone Midtown or Upper East Side. You didn't upzone any of those. But when you do upzone communities, people have got to feel like they have a stake in the gains. So you can make a very simple trade off to the developers. Say, we're going to upzone a community. But we're going to we're going to add additional tax, and that tax is going directly into the into the pockets of working class and poor New York City residents, directly into it. And people say, "Well, that's crazy." Well, what the hell do you think Alaska does with its oil? It does exactly the same thing. New York City does not have the capability to print money like the federal government does, but it does have the, the capability to create value out of thin air, and it does that with upzoning. And we should not make laws or make policy decisions that create value out of thin air and only allow for wealthy people to benefit from that. People who have stuck it out in New York City for so long during good times and more importantly, during bad times should benefit from that. So we're almost out of time and I really appreciate your candor. It's been really fun to talk to you. It's really exciting to think about a challenge for 21 of getting you on tape. Uh, swearing. So we definitely want to have you back uh, for another Zoom, uh, possibly with some of your uh, competitors in the New York City race. I want to ask uh, very shortly, so by what date will we know whether how this exploration is going? Well, when will you decide? Well, and then I want to give you a... You can't drag things out. Uh, that, that's for sure. Um, the And I, I, I should note that my number one priority right now is getting COVID relief across the finish line. Um, Nothing's more important. So January 20th, you leave, you leave Congress? Well, I leave sooner than that. January 20th is when the president is sworn in. I'm oh, not, sorry. I've got two know that. Here. So look, I'm not going to give you a date, but uh, I- January? I, Sometime in January? I do, I do suspect that we're, you know, we're not going to drag anything like this out. Um, uh, that, that, that would be just stupid. Um, but most importantly, irrespective of whatever decision I make. Uh, I'm not going to go anywhere and I'm going to keep fighting. And I'll do that as a supporting actor. 
I'll do that with my name on the ballot. I'll do that in any way that I think can add value. Um, and that's what's important to me. Um, because I believe in this country uh, and I believe in, in our city. Um, and that's not because of what it has been, but what it could be. And so that's a fight worth fighting for and I'm gonna stay in it. All right, I'm gonna leave it there. Congressman Max Rose, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to everybody who submitted questions and who uh, shared our links. Um, we're thrilled to have you at this and other events. You should check our events page and our weekly newsletter on Sundays that tells you all about our Zooms. We'll have many more related to the mayoral election um, in the new year. Uh, and you should certainly be around Congressman Rose with a tape recorder, if you can be, to catch him uh, breaking his resolution. But thanks again to Lisa Lepson and Dina Cooperman of our team for helping to put this together, and Jonas on Congressman Rose's team for working with us. We're really happy to see you. Chag Sameach to everyone for the end of Hanukkah, and Happy New Year, May 2021. Be a little easier than 2020. Thanks again.